Okay. Thank you very much, Juan, um, and thank you for inviting me uh, to the meeting. It's a great pleasure to come back to Barcelona. Um, it's a particular pleasure to be able to congratulate you on ten, uh, the first 10 years. Um, I look forward, hopefully, to an invitation after the next 10 years. Um, and it, it, it is wonderful to come and see how much the, the, the Institute has grown and what a huge success it was. Um, I can also say that I was uh, uh, fortunate um, earlier this year to have been invited in a joint venture that the, the PhD students organized together with their uh, colleagues from Italy. Um, and I got the chance to go and, and interact with a lot of the students. And that was also fantastic. So I think it's always a great sign of the health of an institute when you've got fantastic PhD students. The, the old guys like Juan and uh, here is not quite so important, but the students is vital. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do then to, con uh, to conclude the, the symposium in, in my talk is to give a, a sort of overview of some of the things that we're particularly interested and exciting, uh, excited about at the moment. And I wanted to raise a number of, of, of issues and in particular to talk about what I see as both challenges to the field but also, more importantly, opportunities. And I think we've seen illustrated very clearly in the talks that, that we've had uh, previously how in cell biology and developmental biology, it's now becoming more and more routine to use proteomic methods uh, in part of your studies. And I want to take up that theme and discuss how we are attempting to use the fantastic opportunities that are being provided by spectacular technical advances, particularly in the area of mass spectrometry-based proteomics, to really become um, a tool of choice for testing hypotheses and identifying new hypotheses and understanding what we're all interested in, which is basic molecular mechanisms that govern the interaction and regulation of, of cells. So, to start with then, I want to just frame one of my questions by, by, by highlighting something that I think is, is really quite important um, and is often in the field, I think, uh, either not thought about or, or not treated in, in, in the right way. And that's just to contrast genomes um, and proteomes. So we all know what a genome is. It's the collection of all the, the genes in an organism. And thanks again to the, the, the technical improvements with things like Illumina sequencing and rapid DNA sequencing, it's essentially possible very, very quickly and cheaply now to sequence lots of DNA. So that's given rise for most of the model organisms that we all work on. Um, to reference genomes. You can look up online um, the, genome, the genome sequence, and we of course know that there are small variations from one genome to another between individuals such as us in this room. But by and large, because genomes in species evolve on an evolutionary time scale, they're not changing in real time. We do see in cases like cancer, and we had that a great talk, you can have profound uh, and important changes that we have to understand in, in, in those cases. But in, in physiological regulation, we don't see a, a large amount of variation in, in a genome. The type of information that's also recorded by DNA sequencing is also relatively simple information. There's just a great deal of it. There's huge amounts of sequence, but it's very monochromatic, simple information. So we know the rules of the genetic code. So if you've got reference genomes, in principle then, you can predict what all the, the in silico, what all the potential proteins are. So are proteomes then just the list of all the proteins that an organism has? And should we then be making reference proteomes? And this is still probably a common um, thing that's done in the field. And I want to make a slightly contentious point that, in my opinion, that's not the right way to go, uh, certainly not for cell biology, because the real um, value of, of studying proteomics is not making a reference proteome analogous to a reference genome, and the reason why is because, unlike DNA sequences, which evolve in an evolutionary timescale, Proteins, um, it's not the proteins that we really are interested in per se, it's rather the properties of these proteins. And what do I mean by that? I mean, it's not just whether a particular protein exists, but how much of it is expressed, where is it in the cell, who is it binding to, how is it modified, 
um, and all these other types of properties, how rapidly is it synthesized and degraded, and how many different functional pools of that protein does a gene encode. So I think it's, it's then not just a list of proteins, but rather these properties and the key fact that under conditions of biological regulation, these properties are highly dynamic and they're changing all the time. This means that how we treat the analysis of proteomic data has to be regarded differently from how we accumulate reference genome sequences. Um, we have to make many, many more measurements and the data are not monochromatic, they are incredibly complex and multidimensional and that requires different approaches and different data analysis uh, procedures. So, um, just to, to summarize that point, I think to really take advantage in cell biology of the opportunity of proteomics, we have to be able to measure, quantitate and analyze these changing protein properties systematically and be able to link that information to other relevant um, uh, data, such as how many different isoforms and, and, and pools, uh, how does it vary in different genetic backgrounds and different cells and so forth. And this is indeed a major challenge, not only for technology, but also for computing science. So just to, to uh, go on with the, the talk, um, uh, I will apologize to anyone in the audience for whom this is all um, second nature, who's, who's involved in this procedure, but I am aware that there are many of us uh, using proteomic approaches, and especially mass spec based approaches these days, who were never trained in this technology as such. And therefore, we've created um, on my lab website a set of resources, we call it the Cell Biologist Guide to Proteomics, um, and it's intended to be the sort of resource that I wish I had had um, some years ago uh, when as a biologist I was trying to get my head around um, methodologies and techniques um, from, from the physical sciences uh, without, without having I've been trained in, in the terminology or, or, or the methodology. So we, we've created this little um, guy here to ask all the silly questions that, um, that you maybe, some of you have been thinking but didn't, didn't think you should, you should ask. Um, and just to explain why the spectra look the way they do, how you record them, how you go about these things. So um, we would invite you to go and look at it. It's uh, a resource we're keen to have feedback on and we're happy to update and, and expand it and I hope some of you find it useful. Um, in a similar vein, um, again with due apologies to all of you who know it's, it's useful, I, I found recently this was also quite helpful. Um, I have to say right at the start that sadly I have no financial interest in the company Thermo. I sincerely wish I did. Um, uh, but they happen uh, not only to be making what, um, as, as a non-shareholder or employee, I, I think most of the people in the proteomics field consider the state-of-the-art instruments, but they also created some very nice um, movies that just illustrate how the technology works and I thought it might be helpful to set the scene again just to explain to some of you who haven't been familiar with it uh, how this works. So with thanks to Thermo for providing this, this is the latest generation of what's now a bench top instrument. You need quite a big bench I have to say but you can fit it into a laboratory and it just illustrates a couple of things that, uh, that hopefully you'll uh, find interesting if you haven't seen this before. Uh, this is just the overall design of the instrument, which is in fact very small, um, quite remarkably small. And then this just illustrates what you're actually doing when you take a, a, a digested protein sample you've extracted from your cell. Each of these little circles then corresponds to a peptide ion. It's focused through this device here called an S-Lens. Um, and then it's fired through a magnetic field which can uh, focus the beam. Um, it will go along and be collected and concentrated and cooled in a little chamber called a C-trap, um, which you'll see here. Um, and then when the ions um, have been cooled and collected, they're shot into this form of mass anal analyzer called an orbitrap. And so you have these charged ions, which are then spat here into the, the analyzer, and by oscillating here uh, it, within the magnetic field, they induce a current that creates a spectrum um, that's proportional to the, the mass charge ratio. Uh, and so, so that's basically what you're doing. So there's a data analysis uh, interesting uh, problem that comes out here. So you can analyze very complex mixtures of, of ions. You can also use it, uh, uh, some uh, clever uh, features of the instrument as well as determining a primary spectrum to, to set a range of masses just like you can use filters in a microscope and then the magnets that as it goes through will um, subtract from this collection of ions all those ions outside the mass range you select. 
And to help you be more confident about your identification of the ions, you can take the, the selected range into a chamber where you collide them with, with gas atoms, fragment the peptides into, uh, into, into fragments, um, and then collect those fragments and spit those into the mass analyzer and collect an MS2 spectrum, which helps you then assign with more confidence the identification of, of the peptide. So that's just a little bit of background that I thought might be helpful, again, in um, uh, putting into context what people are actually doing. And over the, the time I've been working in this area for almost 20 years, the improvement in this technology to get to the point you, you're at now is really quite remarkable. So that's the type of technology then combined with having these reference genomes which give you a prediction of what every open reading frame in an organism potentially might be able to encode. And uh, our challenge then is to use that information as wisely and effectively as possible to uncover uh, uh, mechanisms and test hypotheses and find new hypotheses in cell biology. Let me highlight what I see as another challenge, however, of the way most proteomics tends to be done. You have a cell and you make an extract from that cell. And what happens when you do that, and then you efficiently analyze the proteins, is that you lose much of this, uh, most of this beautiful information about the organization of the cell um, because you are averaging values across cell populations and subcellular fractions. So one of the big challenges that we deal with to make the proteomic technology work better for us in cell biology is to, is to solve this problem that we are continually, in a simple way, throwing away much of the information that as cell biologists we really want to have. And I think uh, you know, the only real way to deal with this um, currently is using a divide and conquer approach. And so what we do now routinely, and I'll show you, is instead of just making extracts uh, directly from cells, is that we combine our proteomic analysis routinely with detailed subcellular fractionation and also extensive protein level fractionation before we digest the, pro the, the proteins into peptides and then use the mass spectrometer, as I just showed you in the video, and get down to this area of then analyzing the data as intelligently uh, as possible. And I'll come back to that point. So I think using routinely um, a lot of cell fractionation and protein level fractionation, is as, as illustrated here, is extremely important um, in keeping track um, of as much of that information that otherwise we would lose. And that's what's allowing us then in the proteomic analysis not just to have a reference proteome and list of names, but to start to annotate properties such as how are, the, how are these proteins distributed in space between different subcellular compartments and organelles. Um, as I'll show you uh, later on, we can start also to separate cells at different stages of the cell cycle um, and look how the proteome changes in response to progression through interface and mitosis. And again, as many of us are interested in, to look at how external signals, whether physiological or um, pharmaceutical, um, affect the distribution of the proteome and its kinetics over time. And I think this has a big role to play in the future in understanding exactly what drugs do to cells um, and hopefully helping to make the cost of studying toxicology much cheaper and more tractable as part of the drug discovery industry. Another big challenge then um, I'd just like to, to, to highlight for that we, we are uh, very um, uh, focused on at the moment is this idea that um, too much in the proteomics field, uh, people talk about proteins and relate them back to a gene. But once again, as we know, and as Tom Maniatis illustrated in, in, in much more detail, in an extreme case, um, a single gene can give rise to multiple isoforms. I'm illustrating here a simple case of alternative splicing giving you two different isoforms of a protein. As Tom showed us, it can actually be many, many different isoforms which can have different interaction partners or different functions. And so this is actually a problem, again, in using the proteomics wisely because what you measure with the standard sort of um, uh, proteomic analysis is not proteins, <coughs> It's fragments of proteins. You isolate your proteins, digest them into peptides, and identify accurately those peptides. And then you're faced with the task of trying to map the peptides you've identified back onto the right protein or isoform 
or pool of the protein. And it isn't just alternative splicing, of course, that can give rise to isoforms, um, protein cleavage, post-translational modification we, we, we all know about, and alternative interaction partners mean that you can even have exactly the same chemical polypeptide making a separate pool, a fu separate functional pool in the cell doing different things because it binds to different interaction partners. And if you're not um, aware of that and you don't take care about it, you can very easily misinterpret the results of your proteomic data. And um, just one very simple way to illustrate that from our own recent data, uh, this is a protein we identified which um, at first glance, looking at just some of the peptides, one has the impression that it's uh, expressed uniformly throughout the cell, but using um, some more sophisticated data analysis procedures at the peptide level to analyze what's going on, we could identify the, the, there were for this protein at least two distinct isoforms expressed in roughly equal amounts, one of which was almost entirely nuclear and the other of which was almost entirely cytoplasmic. So that's just one way I can illustrate that without taking a bit more care about it, you can um, actually come to fundamentally wrong conclusions about what's going on and that by doing more um, careful analysis of the data you're recording, you can extract much more uh, information routinely and we've been able then uh, in, in high throughput to analyze and, and detect the existence of isoforms without relying upon um, RNA-seq data or alternative splicing data, and then cross-correlate those isoforms with properties such as localization and, and, and turnover rates. And in the interest of time, I won't go through all the ways we did that. If you're interested in knowing a bit more about it, um, in a, uh, a recent edition of molecular cellular proteomics this year, which was a special issue published with an EU-funded network called Prospects that um, uh, I, I'm in together with your director. Um, it's a very uh, exciting collaborative uh, project uh, and we have three articles in, in that uh, which describe how we go about trying to systematically um, measure isoforms and tie them into biological properties. So then, again, in summary, what we're really seeing is that to maximize the value of proteomics in cell biology and developmental biology, we're dealing with a complex problem of multidimensional analytics. And this is something that can only be uh, approached at a computational level because we now have the ability by design of experiment, thanks to the powerful instrumentation, to, um, to measure in high throughput system-wide in cells and organisms, turnover rates, interaction partners, um, abundance levels, uh, PTM patterns, in, in a, a level of detail that simply wasn't uh, possible and, and, and before. And we want to maximize what we can do with these data. And importantly, that allows us not only to test a hypothesis we, originally, we uh, previously had, but I think this is going to become one of the major ways of generating in an unbiased way new hypotheses. And that's the, that we can then go on and, and, and test. And that's the, the basis then of, of the title of my talk. Because what I'm saying is that the traditional model in which we all do our experiments, where we think of a, an experiment, we carry out, collect some data, and interpret the results and, 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 and see how it matches with our predictions. Um, the aim is to, is to turn this into super experiments uh, super, in this case, referring to the scale of the experiments, not by changing this model at all, except that we take care that every experiment that's done is consistently recorded and annotated with a detailed and consistent set of metadata and collected together in a complex multidimensional data model in a, in a sophisticated database. And the advantage of this, which um, it is perhaps obvious to some of you, is that as well as getting results that can confirm predictions that you already had, by being able to draw sophisticated comparisons between the many parameters across hundreds and thousands of experiments, we've been doing this for, for four or five years now, we can derive new results and make new predictions or hypotheses um, that answer questions that none of us had thought of when any of the individual experiments were carried out. And that's, that's the, the benefit of recording consistent metadata and of organizing your data systematically. Um, 
this raises then a very important point. It's a challenge for us as biologists. So this was the first paper that I published together with my um, longtime friend and collaborator and former uh, next door neighbor in, in EMBL, Matthias Mann, uh, who introduced me to electrospray mass spectrometry in the early 1990s. And this was the first paper that I published using this technology. And um, actually, we identified a number of proteins, but one of them was novel, and we were very proud of that. And it was, it was great. One protein, one paper. If only it was the same today. Um, today, we are routinely analyzing you know, 5,000 5, uh, plus proteins. Um, per time point, per sample, um, multiplexed in a large way. And so this has, has moved uh, proteomics into the, the realm of what is, is reasonably described as big data. And that's a term that's really best used when the volume of the data that are being generated exceed the tools conveniently available within the field to manage and, and handle it. Now, in biology, um, so far, um, unlike physics and astronomy, the only field that's really had to contend with the impact of big data problems so far is the genomic sequencing field. Um, and, and that is a, a significant issue. However, as I said before, without being disrespectful to anyone in that field, um, by any means, the type of data they're recording are rather simple in structure. It's just a very large amount of it. In the case of proteomics data, as I've tried to illustrate, what we really want to be recording is complex multidimensional data uh, that, that brings in very new and complex challenges to analyze it. Um, this is something I thought might be of interest uh, also to, to you or to some of the people in the audience because we have to improve our vocabulary uh, over time. Um, when I first started uh, doing mass spectrometry experiments, um, I was vaguely aware, I think, of what a, a gigabyte was. I certainly wasn't when I was a PhD student, um, but I, I, I knew what that was. I, I, I'd like to think I knew what a terabyte was, but I can't honestly say I definitely did. Um, and, and now, of course, we have devices on our desktops. In fact, I have one in my, my bag there that, 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 that can contain a terabyte or more in a small space. Um, we've had to learn new words, and I guess most of us now also know words like terabytes for a, for a thousand, uh, petabytes for a thousand terabytes. Um, these still create serious problems in terms of the amount of um, equipment you need just to store the data, and by the time you, you get up to a thousand petabytes, an exabyte, um, you basically would need a building the size of the, of the CRG uh, with current storage technology to, to store all that information, and it, by the time you've got a thousand of those, you probably would need most of Barcelona uh, completely full. Um, it's been discussed in the UK, if Scotland declares independence, we might just use it as a large data store <laughs> for all the information, and my lab's trying to contribute to that uh, idea. Um, I don't know, j just, I don't know, have a competition. Does anyone know what a thousand zettabytes is? Um, it's, it's, it, if you did know that, I think you need to get out more. But um, uh, th this is it's sort of interesting. We, we will assume the technology will improve to make these devices smaller. But nonetheless, th there's a race going on here. And I'll tell you why. Because um, if you take something like the Large Hadron Collider, um, the most uh, uh, available estimates that I could find for how much data it produces is in the order of currently 15 petabytes of data per year. That's quite a lot of, of data. However, here's one of those mass spectrometers that I was showing you um, on a bench in my lab. Um, and we are estimating that we are currently generating with this roughly 15 terabytes per year. So that's 1,000 times less, but that's only one instrument. And so I do remind you, in, in the particle physics community, most particle physicists don't have a large hadron collider on their bench top. Um, and so when you're looking at 15 petabytes, you're looking at a volume of data summed up for the entire field, not for an individual laboratory. Um, I'm very pleased to say we just um, obtained funding to, to buy up to another 10 of these instruments. Um, so that means in, you know, in a single laboratory, you can already multiply this number by 10 or, or, or 20. And when you integrate that, um, uh, and I'm not competing anywhere close to Matthias Mann, so uh, when you integrate that across the field, actually, we are pretty close to what the particle physics guys um, are doing in terms of, uh, of, of, of data generation. And since I don't think there's any rapid plans to build another Large Hadron Collider 
anytime soon, I actually think in the proteomics field we're going to overtake them very soon. So these issues to do with the volume of data and how we best use it are a serious problem. So how do you deal with that? The only way I think you can do is to build um, software solutions for these large data problems. And so for the last four, four or five years, um, this has become a major project in my lab. Now a quarter of my lab are computer scientists. Um, and we've developed a project that I call PEP Tracker. I'd just like to mention it to you. It's designed it hand in hand with the application of proteomics data uh, and developed by, by um, uh, software engineers um, directly for, for the use of biologists. One of the things I would just like to highlight is as these data volumes in, in increase, we, we absolutely need solutions that are scalable. And just to explain what I mean by that, um, as we have more and more instruments generating larger and larger files, if the time taken to analyze a single file, let's say, is two hours, the time taken to analyze 10 files with all the, the software or solutions, either freeware or uh, commercial software that I'm aware of, is 10 times the time it takes to analyze one file. So we have been building a solution that is scalable so that the time it takes to analyze 10 files is the same as the time it takes pretty much to analyze one file. And that, I think, is absolutely key to doing the analysis uh, at a speed that's fast enough to, to meet the, the demands of large-scale data generation. And we have to put that hand in hand with powerful analytical tools to visualize and, and analyze data on this scale. And I mean by that tools that are easy to use and intuitive for biologists, not ones where you have to go back to a, a computer specialist and ask them to analyze the data for you. So as I said, part of this project um, means that for every experiment you do, I think it's essential that you have a, a large number of axes to the data corresponding to the, the metadata about every aspect of the experiment that you can search and cross compare. Um, and Another thing I want to say is that I think this provides a great opportunity uh, for new ways to share data with the community. So as part of this project, I'm committed to making all the data that we generate freely available in the most useful form possible uh, uh, for the whole community to take advantage of. And um, that means we have to be imaginative in how we can do that. And I think making your data um, available to the community ought to mean more than simply dumping a large amount of information in some sort of server that's almost impossible for anyone to, to use effectively or make sense of. And so that's why we've been putting a lot of effort into structuring the data, because there's a huge difference between structured and unstructured data, building um, a powerful data model that works in n dimensions, and building a set of intuitive tools that can be accessed online to allow you to interact with the data. Um, and so I've launched a project uh, uh, that I call the Encyclopedia of Proteome Dynamics to try to meet this challenge that there is no single reference proteome that makes sense. There's a wide spectrum of overlapping proteomes that are relevant at different times and in different genetic backgrounds and different circumstances. And we have to find the ways of providing this information quantitatively and making it available for our colleagues to interact with and evaluate. And so as part of this project, we've built a set of online accessible viewers in which you can see um, in detail the type of data that we are generating um, where, because we uh, perform um, statistical analysis in our data, including analysis of uh, values for different peptides assigned to the same protein, as well as from replicates of the same experiment, we're able to, uh, as much as possible, put error bars in the data and also show the data either uh, for whole cell analyses or for different subcellular fractions uh, and so forth and provide as much of that information to you as possible. We've currently built viewers um, that provide information about uh, um, intensity or, or abundance of proteins, subcellular localization, rates of synthesis and degradation and turnover, um, giving you access to the peptides we've identified. And we're currently building in parallel information um, where we've performed RNA sequencing data also um, to correlate protein and RNA expression levels. So this is our small attempt to address what I see as a significant problem. Um, and that is underpinned 
by um, something called a data warehouse. So this is the computational approach that we are taking to try and achieve that. Um, you might be amused that rather than um, this coming from traditional bioinformatics, this has been greatly helped by collaboration with uh, the computing science department on our campus, who are the UK leading um, uh, academic centre for a, a new exciting area of computing science called data science and business intelligence. And so what we are actually doing is borrowing technology that has rapidly developed in the commercial sphere. Um, so it, Tesco's is, is the UK, I think,'s biggest supermarket. If you're more familiar with Walmart or a Spanish equivalent, that's fine. They, they all work in a similar way. They, 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 they provide one of the biggest con games there is. In return for promising you some sort of trivial discount, they collect multi-dimensional information from you um, every time you go to the supermarket, and they use it brilliantly to know the buying patterns of their public so that they know which products to put on which shelves and which stores at which time of year so that if you're like me, almost every time you go into this damn place with a shopping list, you come out with the shopping list plus a bunch of extra things that you never intended to buy that you happen to see because it was close. And that's not a coincidence. Um, if you go on Amazon, and, and I don't have any shares, unfortunately, either on Amazon, but if you go and, 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 and buy a book, it isn't very long before you start getting emails advertising other books that you might be interested in, and a surprising number of them you are interested in, because they are very, very clever at cross-matching different parameters from the metadata they collect from their customers. This technology we've been able to use and adapt to cross-correlate parameters and metadata from proteomics experiments, and build this then into an automated pipeline that, that without user intervention can take the, the raw data files that stream off the instruments, process them efficiently in a scalable fashion, uh, and collect them with, with no user intervention. This also, um, as we are continually trying to develop new and better algor algorithms, this allows us um, to also, uh, in a facile way, reanalyze the stored raw files if we're able to get more data back, um, and then to underpin this whole idea of super experiments um, by having this multidimensional repository. And as I said, uh, an integral part of this is also building the sort of um, interfaces and tools that make it easy for you to interact with your data. And I want to just show you one simple example that one of the things you, you, you may want to do, and, uh, and I hope this is a, a, of interest, is not only to see in a two-dimensional representation um, of a protein sequence all the peptides that were actually identified, and we actually uh, color-coded them based on their values, but if the protein has a crystal structure, we can pull the crystal structure out and it, with a range of different options for different space filling models, we can then highlight and examine in 3D which peptides were actually identified in your experiment, either from that last experiment, or we can superimpose the data from our database from every experiment that we've done. We can superimpose any combination of PTMs that we or, or, or uh, any other experiment has identified, um, and also build in statistical algorithms to evaluate that. There's a lot of other features that I don't have time to show you, but I hope that would be of interest. I'm going to briefly finish off by just illustrating then how we've taken some of this technology to address two of the issues that highlight um, the focus of this uh, EU project called um, Prospects, which in other words is to move forward the analysis of protein expression in space and time. So, um, we're also doing a bunch of other experiments, which I won't have time to get into, uh, and to use this approach to give um, a very detailed um, functional annotation of changes in proteomes when cells are transformed, when they differentiate uh, under conditions of viral infection or drug treatment, which I think are, are obvious and, and maybe of, of interest. But I'm just going to highlight then um, what we've been doing to look at how the proteome changes um, as cells move through the cell cycle. Now, typically, there are two ways of studying this. Um, either, and perhaps most commonly, we use inhibitors to arrest progression through the cell cycle at specific stages and to accumulate cells at a specific stage, whether it's G1, uh, S, or G2, whatever, or, or, or M phase. However, I, I also, um, of course, we all know that the drugs can have secondary effects, and that is, I think, an issue that's never properly been um, worked out how much of the effect of the drug is, is because it's blocking the cell cycle and how much of it is a metabolic effect of the perturbation that the drug induces. 
Um, I'll just point out that, as, as you know, that as cells move through interphase, the other thing they do is get larger. They double the amount of DNA and, 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 and protein, approximately, and we can take advantage of that using a very old-fashioned, but actually very useful technique, um, which some of you uh, may have heard of, perhaps some not, called um, counterflow centrifugal elutriation, where without having to use any sort of inhibitors or drugs at all, we can simply uh, exploit the fact that the size of cells on average in G1, uh, S and G2 is different. Um, to use a physical method of, of, of spinning them in a rotor and collecting the cells, and this actually works extremely well as long as you can prevent the cells clumping together. And so we've been able to do a large-scale analysis with several different uh, human cell lines, and this just shows cell sorting analysis where we evaluate these different fractions that have been separated on the elutriator, and it shows you how quite nicely each of the fractions um, enriches for cells at different stages then um, of interface. Um, and then in collaboration with, this, with uh, Mike Stratton's group at the Sanger Center, we've performed for every sample detailed analysis in, in, in my lab of protein levels using label-free analysis and at the Sanka Center using RNA sequencing analysis of RNA levels throughout interface. This is so far um, unpublished. Um, I just want to highlight a couple of points. The first thing is we're pretty confident it worked quite well. If you simply take the, the, the approach of using um, these go-tagging clouds, where you make the size of the go term proportional to the number of identifications. We see for both the protein IDs and the transcript IDs at the same level, the biggest go terms we're pulling out are cell cycle, mitosis, mitotic cell cycle, and so forth. Um, we also, of course, know, know the identities uh, of all of, uh, of these. And I just want to, to make a, a couple of points. Um, one is that our data are very reproducible, both between technical replicates and between biological replicates. If you do scatter plots between either technical or biological replicates, you see very, very uh, close agreement and, and Pearson correlation coefficients up at 0 0.98, 0 0.99. However, at any stage of the cell cycle, if we compare the levels of protein with the cognate transcripts, we see a clear correlation, but not a terribly impressive one. And so we typically are getting values of about 0.5 to 0.56, something like that. So in other words, I'm not disputing the central dogma <laughs> that RNA makes protein. I suspect that's probably correct. Um, all I'm saying is to remind you what I think has also been seen in many other studies by other groups, although it means a little bit controversial, that um, RNA levels in many biological situations can have rather low predictive value in telling you how much protein is being expressed. So if you're seduced by the ease and cost of rapid RNA sequencing, that's great. But if you're using it as a surrogate for inferring how much of a protein is there, I would urge you to do that with caution, because it's not always a reliable way without checking, to be, to be sure. Um, there's a lot of other information coming out of this project. Um, it's confirmed virtually all the known cell cycle regulated proteins, um, and we found some other interesting proteins that I'll come back to in a second uh, that also appear to be regulated. So the fact that RNA doesn't always correlate with protein abundance, RNA abundance not always change with protein abundance, one of the reasons for that, um, I think, is because the phenomenon of using regulated protein degradation to control cellular processes, I suspect, at least in mammalian cells, is much more widespread than perhaps had been previously realized. There are some uh, very well-known examples, um, such as P53, which is made continuously in the cell, but rapidly degraded, ubiquitinated and degraded, until the cell is exposed to a range of different uh, insults or oncogene activation, in which case the degradation is, uh, is prevented by a well-known mechanism. Uh, it, the, the E3 ligase, um, uh, HDM2, is no longer able to ubiquitinate P53, and the levels of P53 rapidly accumulate. Um, I must admit, I thought that was a rather unusual example or an exceptional example. Um, I'm not saying it's common, but I think it's far less unusual than we'd previously thought. Um, and so we have gone out systematically to look for proteins that are being rapidly degraded in cells and also to combine that with our strategy of subcellular fractionation so that we can 
do that not only for the whole cell, but to evaluate whether there are classes of proteins whose stability is differentially regulated in different subcellular compartments. Um, the take home message is yes, there are. Uh, we've also combined that with the methods we use to identify protein isoforms through whole level protein separation. Um, and again, I just want to say that the, you know, one of the advantages of this uh, in the design, design of, the, of the experiment, what we're doing this is a SILAC experiment where we're basically blocking with, with cyclohexamide either protein synthesis or the proteasome uh, with a, a, a drug to, to, to block that. Um, and we can evaluate the, these data um, quantitatively by doing multiple replicates. We're able to get very valuable p-value numbers to assess the statistical significance of the data we record. And as I said, we've done it individually for different subcellular compartments. And that turned out to be crucial in some cases because if you simply look at the whole cell, the dilution effect of proteins from other compartments and abundant proteins from other parts of the cell lead you to miss interesting examples that you can find by concentrating in proteins only within a specific compartment. So, as I said, we're able to um, integrate here uh, and put on our online data viewers for each of the proteins we detect um, values uh, for the abundance of each protein as how it's distributed between these different compartments. We're able to analyze the whole data set and by analysis of goal terms to focus on specific processes uh, which give us clues about processes where it looks like regulated protein degradation may be uh, contributing. Um, obviously that includes things like uh, cell cycle, um, but it also it highlighted uh, some things like uh, chromatin modification and, and chromatin organization where that perhaps was not something that was appreciated before. And it's also been incredibly useful um, in combination with other techniques in building protein networks um, using these properties to uh, cluster proteins based on their, their functional annotation and find relationships between uh, different proteins. So that led us um, to, to something, uh, just as I come to, to the end of my talk, uh, I'd like to share with you. Um, I think, I don't know if, if any of you are familiar with this or not, I think you're all familiar with this part which is that you, know, you translate an mRNA and you make a, a native protein and we had the beautiful talk um, from Ada Yonath providing the crystal structure of the bacterial ribosome and, and how that process worked. One of the issues that came up in the discussion, however, was how accurate that process is. In other words, how often is the polypeptide chain that's produced by the ribosome ending up as a properly fold, folded native active protein? Um, Ada's view was, that it, it, I think, that, uh, um, that it, it was extremely uh, if, efficient. and. Um, I, I just want to, to, to raise with you some uh, uh, data that has recently emerged, not just from my lab, but from a number of different groups, our, our data fit with this, that, that maybe say, at least in the context of mammalian cells, that might not be um, the case. So as you know, if you're doing a pulse chase experiment or you're looking at protein stability, what are, and as we did in our experiments, if you treat the cyclohexamide, you can effectively block this process. And then the proteins that were made previously, when you can't make any new ones, then decay. And um, we can evaluate then the fraction of them which decay by ubiquitination and degradation by the proteasome. But there are other, other processes, including uh, secretion out the cell, as well as other degradation pathways that can contribute to that. And we've been evaluating the, how the proteome is dealt with by these different processes in the cells that we've studied. Um, what I hadn't, I must admit, appreciated is that while if you block translation with cyclohexamide or, or, or other translation inhibitors, you apparently have little or no effect on the rate of degradation of the pre-made proteins, it turns out that any of the drugs that you might use to block proteasome activity, um, the reverse isn't true. And as soon as you inhibit the proteasome, um, you quickly set up a response that shuts down global translation. So whenever you use a proteasome inhibitor, you're actually inducing a feedback inhibition on the ribosome. And, and we think we know now a lot more about the mechanism whereby that takes place. Um, and we think that the reason for that, consistent with data from other groups uh, which preceded our analysis, um, is that at least in the context of mammalian cells, rather than almost all the proteins that are made being native, a significant fraction, and some people are talking about fraction of 30 percent, 
of the translation products of the ribosome may end up as non-native, um, either mistranslated or misfolded proteins. It might just be a folding problem, not an incorporation problem. These guys are rapidly ubiquitinated and degraded, and under normal conditions, probably a large amount of what the proteasome is doing is actually removing the unsuccessfully expressed non-native proteins that are produced from the ribosome. Um, and in the immunology field, uh, there's this hypothesis called the DRIP hypothesis that this defective ribosome product um, is a major contributor to, to peptide generation and, and antigen presentation. Um, in fact, if you inhibit the proteasome and the cell is no longer able to deal with this pool that rapidly accumulates, you get rapidly no new proteins made, and what happens instead is that you trigger the unfolded protein response, um, you rapidly promote phosphorylation of EIF2 uh, alpha on, on, on serine 51, and that inhibits translation. So that's just um, one of the things is to be aware of is that inhibiting the proteasome blocks translation, but inhibiting uh, translation doesn't block the proteasome, and I'm just putting it to you as a suggestion that the cell maybe has partly evolved the proteasome to take exquisite care to make sure that whatever fraction of translation products are not native are rapidly removed from the cell. And if it loses the ability to remove that pool, um, then um, it shuts off making new protein. And when you inhibit um, with the proteasome with any of the drugs that you might care to use, you don't end up uh, then accumulating all cellular proteins. Instead, what you do is that most proteins don't change their levels, and instead you accumulate a pool of polyubiquitinated proteins that we think corresponds to this group here. So as my very last point then, um, I've talked a lot about high throughput system-wide analysis, but at the end, as cell biologists, we really want to get back to studying mechanisms and in individual proteins. And one of the other benefits of this sort of approach, I think, is its ability in a system-wide unbiased screen to identify uh, novel components that give us new insights into mechanisms and processes. And I just want to finish with one last slide that, that highlights such a, an example. Um, I've called this uh, P. Wayne. Um, because it's a protein without an interesting name. And if I told you what else it was called, you would say that's not a very interesting name. So that's what we call it. So this was a, a protein that came out of both the cell cycle analysis, as a protein that's being cell cycle regulated, and out of a parallel separate analysis in the lab, and that's the beauty of having all the data in one database, looking at rapidly degraded proteins. Um, again, for, for some of the, the, the younger people in, in the audience, surprisingly even to me, this is a protein for which um, we have found uh, zero publications um, uh, so far uh, specifically analyzing this protein. Um, there are two bits of information about it that are available, and they both come from high uh, throughput studies of different types, where this protein was analyzed among many thousands of others. One was the project of Reiner Peppercott and Jan Ellenberg to use siRNA whole genome screening to find proteins which affected cell cycle progression, and reassuringly, siRNA knockdowns from their study showed cell cycle phenotypes. Um, we found that this protein, which is shown here in red, and this is a, a picture from the OMX super resolution microscope, in Dundee, it's actually staining or, or decorating intermediate filaments in a beautiful reticular network. However, it's not present in all cells. And the reason it's not present in all cells is quite evident when we superimpose a, a cell sorting fax analysis um, for DNA with immunofluorescence staining for this protein because cells in, uh, in G1 phase are essentially negative. And so uh, we're aware then why it came out as a rapidly degraded protein, because in our screen, most of the cell, the U2S cells, uh, were in G1 phase. And as soon as the cell leaves mitosis, this protein is rapidly degraded, and, and, and we know the, the mechanism for that. <clears throat> it's, um, it's cell type specific in its expression pattern. It's differentially modified. Um, and this is the other high throughput study where there's some data from the Human Protein Atlas project that's led by another of our partners from the Prospects Network, Matthias Ullen in Stockholm. Um, this protein is specifically uh, preferentially expressed in epithelial cells. It's present in skin, um, and in their uh, histopathology sections, it's one of the most strongly upregulated proteins in its expression in, in aggressive forms of, of skin cancer. So despite 
evidence of functional importance for cell uh, uh, cycle progression and potential clinical relevance, as I said, um, so far, uh, no one had even identified that this protein was regulated during a cell cycle, let alone its function. So I'm very hopeful, um, not only that the work we're doing with this at the moment, we're, we are uh, well on the way to generating a knockout mouse for it, um, that the work we're doing with this protein, but the other types of proteins that we can find through these screens and also make available by sharing all the data with the community um, might really help uh, to, to, to bring up some interesting new projects uh, for the whole community uh, going forward in the future. And I think one of the challenges then is that this type of thing, um, the approach that we are taking, um, which I believe can, can lead to a more biologically relevant annotation of genomes, not just for tissue culture cells or human cells, we're also applying it to model organisms, and including nematodes, for example, it works extremely well, um, and most importantly, to reveal new biological mechanisms, and I, I would be really pleased if other people were interested in using similar approaches and taking a view of uh, pooling the data, not only from all the experiments in my lab, but also from other people's labs who are willing to share their data in a similar way. Uh, and with that, um, I'll thank uh, all the people, some of whom I've tried to mention as I, as I go along, who carried out the work. Our collaborators are here, um, principally in, in, in the Prospects Network, uh, the two Matthias's, um, and, and, and here in the um, uh, Sanger Centre on, on the cell cycle work, to thank the Wellcome Trust and the UK Research Councils and, and the EU who have funded this. And of course, to, to thank everyone here for uh, uh, for staying to the end um, and uh, to thank um, all the, the, the management of the CRG and all the, the group leaders, students and postdocs for making such a great institute. Thank you very much.